So it's all very well getting the um, ISO from Gen 2, which I'll show you if I go to the Gen 2 page. Uh, welcome to Linux, Gen 2 Linux. And if we go to downloads, this is the image we want here, this live GUI USB image. You can see it says it's three gigabytes, so it's, it's a bit more of a reasonable size than it used to be. Um, but as I say, if, if the size of the flash drive that you have to hand is, um, you know, at least that size, then I'd, I'd recommend Gen 2 over Endeavor OS. But if you have got a smaller drive, a uh, flash drive less than three gig, then Endeavor OS, it will look a bit different, but it should behave just, just the same. Um, I say should behave because when we come to do tests, sometimes there are some tests that are affected by the host um, distribution and they may produce slightly different results. But um, uh, I'll mention this when we come to tests, as long as you don't get wild, wildly inaccurate uh, results or errors, then that, that should be okay. So what I'm going to do is to start that downloading because it will take um, a little while. And then what I'm going to do is we need some tool to write that image to a flash drive. So what Gen 2 recommend is something called um, Rufus. Uh, I don't think it's in this bit here. No, somewhere else. It's probably in the handbook where it tells you how to do this. But basically, if you type in Rufus into the browser, and it's this first one here, HTTPS Rufus.ie. This is a little tool that will take images. What it basically, what it does, it can create bootable um, USB drives. Um, obviously, we're downloading an ISO image, so it's already going to be bootable. It's just something we're going to use to actually write the image to the USB drive. So I've come down to the download. The There's several options here to download. Perhaps the easiest one is this portable version. You don't need to install it. It's just a self-contained executable. Um, trouble with, this is with installing things on Windows is sometimes it needs to be rebooted and it just adds to the time to get things done. So I'll just get rid of this advert. Okay, that's downloaded nice and quickly. I'll open this file. Uh, not bother about updates because we're going to be losing this anyway. And that's the main interface. And all we've got to do now is wait for the live GUI to uh, finish downloading. So I'll put the video on pause and resume when that has finished. Okay, so that's just finished. So what I'm going to do now is go back to this Rufus program. Let's just minimize that. And what we'll do now is to select that image by clicking the select button. And by default, it's taken us to the downloads directory, which is where that ISO image is that has just been downloaded. So I'll click on that and do open. And the next thing I need to do is to plug in the flash drive. So I shall do that now. And hopefully Rufus will automatically see that flash drive, which it has done. Um, there's no other settings that need to be changed here. We just need to click the start button. Um, one thing that might be worth doing is just to actually check that the device is the device you've just plugged in and you do want to write to. Um, it's the only flash drive I've got plugged in at the moment, so I know that can be the only device. But if you have got other devices in or if it accidentally selects your C drive or something like that, then or another drive, um, it's just worth checking that. But as you can see, that's the only option. And it is a 16 gig flash drive that I've just plugged in, so I'm happy with that. I'll click Start. And what I've found is probably best to use here. I don't know if the ISO image works, but DD is the tool we would normally use in Linux. So I've elected to use 
right in the DDD, sorry, the DD image mode. So click OK there. Gives you a last warning that the device you've selected will be destroyed, all the data on there, rather, not the device itself. Click OK. And this will probably take another 10 to 20 minutes to write. Unfortunately, let's say because it's an old machine, it's only a USB 2, even though the device is uh, a USB 3. There is a log you can get here. You can see it's gone blue to show, I presume, that there's been an update. Um, so you can just see some more technical information about the both the image and the device that you're writing to. So I'll um, pause the video again and come back when this is complete. Okay, so that has finished writing. Uh, all successful with the looks of it. So if I close this and just go to uh, disk management, we should be able to see what partitions have been written to that uh, flash drive. Just to confirm that it's written okay. Yep, there it is there. It's got three, uh, in fact, sorry, two partitions written and the rest, because it was only three gigabyte ISO, the rest of the flash drive has not been touched. So that looks all okay. So what I'm going to do now is to reboot and um, I need to intercept the starting up so that I can ensure that this, uh, this, yeah, this USB flash drive is... Um, booted rather than rather than the Windows operating system, which is on the disk. And how you do that depends depends from or varies from BIOS to BIOS. Um, this is a Lenovo machine, so in this case, it's F12. That I have to press as it's booting um, on Asus motherboards, which are AMI based American Mega Trends. Uh, it's F8, some motherboards it's F2, um, and so on. So you, you'd have to look up your motherboard to find out what button you need to press to intercept that. So I'm going to do restart. And as it boots, you'll see the screen break up as the video signal changes frequency and changes resolution. Um, I'll try and get it stabilized so you can actually see what's happening on the screen. Okay, so that's because I pressed the buttons too many times. And it doesn't look like it's detected the flash drive. So what I'm going to do is to um, actually power down the machine and try that. Oh, it looks like I missed it. Oh no, I've got it. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So it looks like by default it's booted into the USB. Um, usually if I've pressed the F12 quick enough, I'll get a little menu coming up, a bit like what you saw, the little blue menu, but it will have any, it will have the USB drive listed there. Um, so obviously I've got this BIOS set to boot from a USB drive by default. Um, one thing yeah, I forgot about this, the Gen 2 Live USB has got is a, a copy of Memtest installed. So um, it's probably a good idea if you've never done any compiling on your machine before to run Memtest. It will basically do a cursory test of the memory. It's not foolproof. Um, I've had Memtest pass uh, without any failures in the past. And when I've come to do some compiling, especially something quite heavy like GCC, the compiler, um, it's failed and it's been because of memory errors. So it's, it's not completely foolproof, but it's a good way of um, getting a bit of confidence in the fact that your machine is capable of doing some, or not your machine, sorry, the memory is uh, up to scratch. 
Um, the thing with compiling is that it stresses the CPU, which then produces a lot of heat. Um, and if your machine can't get rid of that heat, either through age, for example, dust and so on, or uh, the cooling's not very good, then that can impact the memory and then that can cause errors. So as I say, this is really only testing the memory rather than stressing the CPU. So it's not really a full test as such. But you can see that what it does, it, um, and get this cursor over here. Um, it basically lists all the uh, DIM cards, all the memory cards that are installed. It shows you some stats about the performance and memory and the configuration. And it will go through doing various tests. And when it's done one pass, it will come up with a big green banner saying a pass. And likewise, if there's a fail, it will come up saying there's a it's been a failure, so I actually did run this yesterday, or was it day before? Um, it did come up as I would have expected with a, a pass, so I'm not going to let that finish. I'm just going to press S to escape to quit that, and what it does straight away is it reboots the machine. Um, I'll try and set the boot up this time with the F12. The trouble is, if you press the F12 too soon, it will complain about a stuck key. Yeah, there, I've got it that time. So you can see it's got the USB key as the first boot up device, which is why it booted by default into, into the uh, flash drive. So I'll just press enter there, get the Gen 2 menu up, and it's the first option. You can use the second option, but it takes a while. Um, I don't know how much memory you need, but basically it reads the whole operating system into memory, and that obviously means then you haven't got so much memory to compile with. So uh, if you haven't got so much memory, it's probably not uh, such a good idea to do that. Just um, use the default version, which means it will just uh, read stuff off the flash drive as it, as it needs it. Uh, so the performance will be a little bit less. Um, I've got 16 gig in this machine, so in theory I think that would be enough to... Um, run the cached version but rather than wait for it to load it I'll just use the default version. As regards memory I would say probably 4 gig is the least you'd need um, compiling as a single core and generally to compile Linux from scratch the, the base Linux from scratch probably you're looking at 1 gigabyte per core is the minimum um, some other packages, if you go on to do BLFS, will use up to two, two gig per core. Um, so that's worth bearing in mind. So as I say, 16 gig should be fine for this machine with four cores. Um, so that might have... Yeah, that's it. It's actually just booted. The, the video uh, loses synchronization sometimes, so I have to resynchronize it. And while that happened there, the desktop actually came up. So this is the default uh, screen you get when the Gen 2 Live USB starts. There's a little welcome there. You can just get rid of that unless you want to read it. And the first thing it prompts us to do is set the key keyboard, which is a good idea to check because by default it sets itself to an American keyboard, um, which is not useful for 99.9% .9 of the world's population. So... What I do here is just change some parameters here. I'm in the UK um, and through trial and error and a bit of investigation, I found that the settings I need are for this 105 key PC. Um, I don't touch anything else on the screen. If I go to layout, click that. You can see it's got the US layout keyboard. Just highlight it and click remove. Then I'll do add. You can search for your country code here. So mine is UK and it's a UK extended Windows keyboard. Click OK. And if you highlight that again, you can actually do a click the preview and you can check that the layout and the physical um, shape and dimensions and positions of the keys actually matches with the keyboard that you're using. Just to double check. So that's fine. That looks OK to me. I'll just click apply. And that now means that whenever I press keys with some of the symbols on that, I'll get the symbol that I expect rather than the ones as translated for a uh, an American keyboard. So I can get rid of that now. Next thing I'm going to do is I'll get a browser up and a terminal up. 
And you can see there's a bit of a pull. Oh, what's happened there? Don't need that. Just cancel that. There's a bit of a pause while things load. So let's position these half and half. Have the browser on the left and all the commands we type in will go in on the right. I'll just make this a little bit bigger. Um, it's best if you're limited to the width of the terminal, it's best to keep it to, uh, if you see when I resize it, it shows you the size, it's the width by the height. So the number of characters wide by the number of characters high. It's best to leave the size to over 80 characters wide. And the reason is when we come to configure the kernel, the uh, interactive interface, the menu configuration won't actually start unless there's at least 80 characters to work with. So um, uh, it's best just to make sure that's over 80 characters. So once again here, I'll try going to the LFS website, see if it's been updated yet. Uh, there it is. Read on nine. No, it's still not been updated yet, so I'll just go to my local copy that I've got. Uh, 